This video is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. Welcome back to our official second episode of the Cancelled series, and behind the scenes I've been chuffing through all sorts of different prompts. There's a lot of productions that get snipped before they end. With it being Miles Morales season, I was thinking of making a Spider-Man 4 episode, though it's been pretty well covered before, and then there's also apparently a whole Raven solo film that I'd like to cover, but there's almost nothing on that thing at all. And for this kind of thing to work, I've got to find a good balance between those two extremes. There is a Who Framed Roger Rabbit sequel that dives into World War II and has a whole Nazi plot going on, but I figured that was a little bit too heavy to bring up in 2020. So instead, we're flipping to something much more easy on the eyes, the beloved family favourite production team behind Pixar. And even with narrowing down to that one category of a production studio, there's several, several projects that just never came to fruition. And really, there was one big main event that spewed out like three different piles of scrap. We'll likely cover just about everything on the channel eventually, but starting us off, we're tackling one of the greatest child film franchises of all time today, Toy Story. Now, you may think looking at 2020 as a whole, we've been feeling the effects of one of the worst timelines, right? Sure, it could be worse in certain places, and at the time of recording this, I don't actually have a clue on who won the US election, so it could easily dig further into a doomed reality. But things still aren't all too bad, as we've still got Pixar. Duh, right? Of, of course we have Pixar. Were we ever really in genuine danger of that not being the case? Well, yes, actually. Once upon a time, Pixar as a company was going through a mini kind of crisis that would have deeply affected the kind of content that they put out. And it all comes down to corporate contracting. Because it always does. Back in 1996, Pixar had released the original Toy Story, and as is probably common knowledge, it really popped off, gaining the company enough popularity and leverage to sign a five-movie deal with Disney. A great opportunity, all things considered. And that would cover A Bug's Life, Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Cars, and I guess even though it's not part of the five, Toy Story 2, too. Well, see, here's the thing. Toy Story 2 was a little bit of an oddball project, since it was originally planned to be a direct-to-video release, and so, at the time of this deal being made, it wasn't actually included as part of the five-film setup. But with the production of this sequel looking very promising early on, Pixar then decided to eventually upgrade it to a full theatrical release. And with its success, the issues then began to arise, with the then-CEO of Pixar, Steve Jobs, and the then-CEO of Disney, Michael Eisner, completely failing to come to an agreement over the terms of any future deal, mostly because of the spout of Toy Story 2. And in 2004, Pixar then went ahead to end their relationship with Disney, with Steve Jobs stating that after 10 months of trying to strike a deal with Disney, we're moving on. We had a great run together, one of the most successful in Hollywood history, and it's a shame that Disney won't be participating in Pixar's future successes. Oof. However, thanks to that original deal, Disney actually controlled the rights to the characters up to and including Cars, as this was set to be the final movie of the original deal. And so Eisner foresaw a way to continue those movies without Pixar in the picture at all. And so, with the legalities on their side, Eisner launched Circle 7 Animation in 2004, having the sole purpose of creating sequels to these Pixar movies that Disney now owned the rights to. Yeah, and people thought Toy Story 4 was a cash grab. This was some literal movie bloodsucking, and apparently this studio production was given the nickname Pixant. I love it. Now, right off the bat, they had three whole sequels churning in the works. A Finding Nemo sequel, a Monsters Inc. sequel, and a Toy Story 2 sequel. Literally day one, it was like, knockoffs, knockoffs everywhere. Now, we'll cover the other two another day soon enough, I'm sure, but we'll be focusing on Toy Story 3 today, as it is the most fleshed out of the bunch and their first piece of work, so obviously it went the furthest. Now obviously there is a real Toy Story 3 now, but there are no connections from that to this production. In fact, any work put into this original threequel was actually ignored by the real Pixar once they got their hands on the sequel project. Though interestingly enough, there are a handful of similarities, but I'll point them out as we get to them. So with all that in mind, let's listen in to this alternate timeline version of a Toy Story that could have been. 
So the premise didn't take place years and years later, but seemingly pretty close to the originals. And it wasn't all about Andy or the generic theming of growing up. No, it was about just toys doing some antics. Your kind of standard in-universe stuff. Toy Story 2 had already established the worldwide mass-produced phenomena of the Buzz Lightyear craze, and this film was to show a whole new element of that even further. With Buzz Lightyear starting to malfunction and being sent to Taiwan to be fixed. That's a real thing. That's actually the plot. Now, obviously, we don't have all of the concept art and certainly no clips of the scrap production, but there are a good handful of concepts, including this one here that was to show the Buzz Lightyear production factory. And of course, with Buzz being shipped to an entirely different country, the rest of the toy gang aren't too pleased and naturally go on an adventure to retrieve and rescue their burdened friend, which, when you look at it really, just kind of sounds like a mirrored retelling of the second film. Instead of Woody being taken for being a prized antique and the others chasing his tail, now it's just Buzz being taken away for reparation purposes. I guess on the one hand you could call it symbolically cyclical, but another word for that is also lazy. Anyway, of course, there's more to the story than just that. The reasoning towards actually hunting for Buzz rather than just waiting for his reparation to complete is actually because Buzz's malfunction is, I guess, a universal problem across the entire line. With the company behind him, Waka Waka Toy Company, choosing to recall every Buzz Lightyear toy back to the factory. Yeah, remember that aisle full of Buzz Lightyears from the second movie? Well, here it is, now all being recalled. Honestly, it's actually a pretty interesting direction to go that bounces off of the original's foundation and is a new avenue of the toy lifespan that we've yet to see in-universe. But that doesn't necessarily mean the whole film is a secret goldmine. You'll see. But since you've made it this far, do consider subscribing. Only you can outbalance out our skewed unsub ratio count. And streaming wise, we are doing more of that Pokemon thing every Monday as usual. And tomorrow, we're doing a casual stream. So, Stardew Valley, Animal Crossing, that kind of thing. It's going to be a real chill thing to just hang out and chat games. Or not. I mean, it doesn't have to be games at all. Just, just casual. With us opening up to the world of factory origins and recalls, all sorts of other broken toys would join the roster and be the target for a whole rescuing coup at this Taiwanese factory. That's still not quite getting round my head. Some of these new characters, which of course never got to see the real light of day, include a Pez dispenser called Juju B B, which I really genuinely cannot understand the purpose of their name. But okay, really pushing the boundary for what's a toy, I guess. I mean, did it have a face? Was it one of those object toys? We'll never really know. There's a handful of character sketches and maybe this Don BB was the thing, but man, I can't tell. There was also said to be a quote, sexy action figure called Cindy Scissors, which at first put me through a whole real rabbit hole of looking to how that would actually translate in a Disney movie, but there's sketches of her too, so I, my, my eyes can go to rest. But at least now we can confirm that it's keeping at least the Pixar standard of how they design their mum characters. Even still, along with kidnapping Pixar's intellectual property, they were also planning to just full on rob you of your childhood as well. I would have figured the whole Barbie element from Toy Story 2 kind of covered this whole front well enough, you know? This is perfectly kid-friendly in concept, but with a couple of male characters clearly being intrigued and with it being them hosting a beach party, you'd think that'd be enough to kind of highlight the idea. Plus, involving Barbie as a character, of course, allows for way more exploration later on from a story front. I mean, it just seems like we've got enough. So adding a sexualized character name pun like Cindy Scissors just seems excessive. Whatever the spin on it, it'd be a little jarring to have in such a kid's movie if sexy was literally their first character trait given for her. There's also a mention of a third character here described as a Linda Hamilton-esque toy called Jade, who seems to fit the description of a female G.I. Joe type person considering the connection to Sarah Connor from the Terminator movies. But with our mentioned new characters being a badass female, a sexualized one, and a living Pez dispenser, I can't really say that these new characters would bring too much to the Toy Story universe. But there is actually more to mention. Alongside more designs of Don BB, there's Handy Hans that looks like a giant safety hazard, Mini RC, which we already have as a character in the films, a mariachi donkey, an apologetic plush bear, and Rosie, who is more prominent in the script, who we'll see more of later on. And then the other elephant in the room, Dax Blaster. 
Oh, another member of Star Command and Buzz's non-malfunctioning replacement. Now that's some of the characters touched on, but what's worse than some of the concepts behind this alternate sequel is the business kerfuffle that was happening underneath it too. Obviously every Toy Story movie is to have a Woody in it, right? Well, this version still had the character of Woody, yes, but Tom Hanks himself? Nope, they would have completely recast him. Similarly, there was John Ratzenberger, who has appeared in every single Pixar film ever, he's Ham the Piggy Bank in the Toy Story series, and yeah, he too would have been recast as he was only willing to participate in it if it was done under Pixar's wing. Oh, dramatic stuff, and probably a big old doomed note on top of it without having Tom Hanks in it, you know? But if you want less drama in your life, you should have a wallet that practically hides in your pocket. And today we're sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. With over 30 colors and styles, there's sure to be one that's right for you. And they're all of great quality as the Ridge have over 40,000 five star reviews. And whether it's a gift for this Christmas season or just something for yourself, you can't go wrong with something built right and practically essential like wallets are. So go ahead and visit rich.com slash Daz and use the code Daz for 10% off. And further to that, there's a lifetime warranty attached to your wallet and you can get a refund for the first 45 days if it isn't to your liking. The offer is as convenient as possible. So thanks again to Ridge for the sponsorship and let's return to Toy Story. But with that brief detour out of the way, there's like a million more images to go through and we actually have a good plot description that tells plenty of detail. So let's open up this portal more into alternate timeline 2004. While well, last time Andy went to cowboy camp for the duration of the film, this time Andy's off again to live like it's the 1700s and his family go along with him. And as Buzz is trying to show off after hearing about Dax's existence, he malfunctions with badly timed wings and a projectile hand that leads him to getting sucked into a vacuum cleaner. With him hesitant to address the issue, the others chuck him into a box and send him off in the mail, only to realize that the whole Buzz line is now being recalled, prompting Woody, Jesse, Bullseye Ham, Rex, Slinky, and Mr. Potato Head to to tail him in a fast shipping box this time. Literally the gang of number two, but with a cast of seven over five. Cause that's not gonna be messy to script at all. Though apparently they did hark back to Jesse being afraid of the darkness, so they're keeping the character traits real. All right. Anyway, in this reality, Buzz is branded with a red R on his neck. Oh, okay, apparently it's just a tag necklace. That's a lot nicer, so all right. And he's put on a conveyor belt leading to the Smasher, pulverizing toys and using a magnet to grab valuable metallic parts. Oof, who needs an incinerator, right? He saves himself, I guess, avoiding the worker's gaze and tries to save others on another conveyor belt, though they're fine since they're being repaired. The red R means recalled. Meanwhile, the others arrive in Taiwan and have to navigate the marketplace, which, you know, fair enough. We've seen the arcades, the toy shop, the fair, whatever. But the actual script sequence gets a little odd in places. It's time for our first sketchy, sketchy script, script description. description. Sure, maybe the sexualized Cindy Scissors was a bit tongue in cheek, but in this version, Woody's change in voice box leads him to communicate with Chinese toys with... A very outdated take of a foreign accent. The idea of talking to foreign toys is actually a little intriguing, but I can assure you this isn't the right way to approach it. And there's more of these kind of oddities to appear. It's not a good look. So Buzz is found and placed in a conference room with Dax Blastar and his sidekick Comet. I couldn't find any pictures of Comet. Though they're apparently starstruck from meeting the best selling toy in the company's history. Cool. And there, the humans tell of how every Buzz owner will get $10 off a new Dax Blastar and that they're announcing it at a big unveiling party. And with that deadline, Buzz is taken into the archive room where they keep one of each toy they recalled. Kind of like the same prison setup from the real Toy Story 3, huh? Hmm. Here, Buzz meets Cozy Rosie, a doll who was designed to keep kids warm at night but ended up catching on fire. And Jade as well, a Barbie-like doll whose knee can accidentally expose a sharp piece of metal. Yeesh. Buzz can scratch kids with his projectile hand accidentally and does to Andy early on, but it's nothing on this. Anyway, no one really tries to escape except for a walkie talkie named Shorty, who's found by a worker and placed on a conveyor belt only to be crushed by the Smasher, surprising everybody but Buzz who tried to warn them. This is a whole new thing going on. And Jade says it would never happen under the former CEO, Old Man Kagoi, who's apparently being left in the dark by the other executives. The plan is now to get the memo about the toy destruction into Kagoi's hands. 
Okay, interesting, but all right. The main toy gang, meanwhile, discover that after some antics again, they're heading to Taipei 101, the tallest building in the world, or at least it was between 2004 and 2010. Huh, that's when the real Toy Story 3 came out. Wow. Anyway, it's time for another round of sketchy, sketchy script, script description. description. This time with the tone of the archive room. What could the toys possibly be doing wrong now? Well, opposite Buzz's cell is Spike the Dog. How generic of a name. He's playing poker. <laughs> yeah, I get it, yeah. With a pair of, quote, hot paper dolls in varying stages of undress. Wait, you lost me. Winning and getting them to undress more before Buzz's hand projects onto the game. All right. Buzz then goes to escape, clashes with Jade, and third sketchy script description of the episode, he semi-swears at her. What a great way to pay homage to his titular catchphrase from the originals. What a, what a great way to keep the spirit of the series going. Anyway, Jade and Rosie now join him on the move, and the toy gang are dropped off at a daycare center and abused. Again, actually coming back in the real thing. Huh, is this really a coincidence? Some antics ensue with Jade and Buzz being diapered and having baby doll faces painted on them and Bullseye is made up like a My Little Pony and Potato Head is stripped and treated like a potato but there, there's a forced wedding apparently. And there's also a general tone of the toy gang being angry at Woody's leadership but it goes nowhere in the whole script and he's rarely in the wrong anyway. So even from an actual like critical thematic sense, this is clearly either an early draft or just not that well put together. But they do see the big Buzz Lightyear billboard and set up a flying device with a toy shopping cart, mylar balloons, and a bubble machine. Huh, I do like this next bit too. Apparently they float past the Taiwanese equivalent of Times Square, but swerve around some power lines, which ends up with them dangling from a building as Rex grabs a security camera and ends up being broadcast on one of the screens in the square. How very in character, I can practically hear that scene in my head. I don't know the implications of being seen for like everyone on TV though. So Buzz continues his journey getting weaker and weaker thanks to his malfunctioning chip and we get some backstory. Rosie never had a kid being recalled before hitting shelves and Jade almost had a kid being chosen by one but the cashier rejected the sale when recognizing the recall. And while most Jades were repaired, she was the one kept for the archive room, hence why she is so edgy. And with them needing to go up five floors and clearly Buzz can't do that because he's apparently dying, they cause a fire through Rosie and use the now emptied elevator to avoid all the people. They reach the conference room to grab the memo and Dax joins in, only for him to portray them in his moment of glory. Obviously he's like the great replacement now. Also he's a transformer type guy, being a vehicle as well. The toy gang reaches the factory loading dock where they see loads of buzzes but none of them theirs. The real buzz is in the pneumatic tubing system flying overhead that luckily everyone just magically sees in the moment with a billion buzzes in the room. And Dax appears too, it's time for a conflict. Though it is another conveyor sequence that we've seen a handful of times in Pixar's films. Dax gets Buzz's group onto the Smasher's path whom the other toys go to save except Buzz and Woody get pinned by clamps. Buzz wiggles out but Woody doesn't, saying to leave him in a moment that's a bit overdramatic and out of nowhere and leaves absolutely nothing anyway. Buzz saves him but gets his leg now stuck and swings out to the side as the Smasher pulverizes just his leg. Jeez, that's a bit of an extreme. But it does lead to this incredibly dark concept art of Woody mourning a lifeless Buzz. I don't know why he's lifeless, it was just his leg, I guess from the pain? Ugh. Still, he comes back disorientated, and we learn that if his chip goes, he'll lose all of his memories. So it's time for an operation. I guess almost a Toy Story 4 shadowing too, huh? He's fixed in the parts department, but factory reset until they mention Andy and the story of Jade and Rosie, which brings back all of his memories. Revived, they work on getting the memo to Kagoi so all recalled toys can be fixed, and they reach his office when Rosie accidentally burns it away. And then things get really weird. So Kagoi catches them in his office and talks to them while they are inanimate. Then he asks them to really talk to him and breaking all rules of the Toy Story universe, kinda, Buzz then talks to him for real and tells him everything. Like this esteemed toy maker understands the living element of the toys he's created. This is both a terrible idea and a fantastic one. However you want to spin it, 
it would explain his disgust for destroying toys, but man... Oh man, what a fan fiction. Kagoi vows to fix every broken toy and races to the Dax Blastar party, inserting his news and bringing out a new fleet of light years, now driving a brand new space rover. Angered and de-pedestaled, Dax then angrily chases Buzz and they all escape for the shipping dock back home that's also been running out of time throughout this whole film. Dax powers up the manufacturing line and creates dozens of Dax Blastars, and Buzz crashes mid-chase from avoiding boxes of the recalled Buzzes from before. It's finale sequence time, and it seems to be awfully action-packed too, being an all-out war between dozens of Buzzes and dozens of Daxes. Ah, oh, I love that kind of concept in mind, there's no concept art of it, but man, just the vision of that is mwah. Though a great joke halfway through does pop up with the janitor popping in, causing everyone to flop to the floor, and then they leave, not wanting to deal with all of this mess, resuming the fight. I mean, honestly, I kind of love that gag. Our versions of the two continue their chase, now with the space rover versus the transformer motorbike thing that Dax is. Meanwhile, the toy gang are ahead prepping the box for shipping, though it has Andy's old address, and they have to restart. And with one successful expansion of his wings, this time no more malfunctioning like the beginning, Buzz sends Dax off into the old box with Woody relabeling it to the address of Sid's house. What a great callback, honestly. Though, wasn't he thwarted and stopped doing what he did last time? Anyway, Tide Loose ends, Jade gives Buzz a kiss because Toy Story 2 isn't sacred anymore, and Andy is none the wiser. Not really the big thematic ending of the real Toy Story 3, but an okay kind of filler episode. Very Toy Story 2 y, and definitely fitting for the direct to video approach that they had planned, but there's all sorts of glaring issues in it too. As another sketchy script description I missed from before, apparently when apologising to Woody for his distrust in him as a leader that still didn't really go anywhere, there was no disobedience and no like actual splitting from the group or anything, Mr. Potato Head goes on to ramble about how his wife's gonna tear him a new storage compartment and forgetting to clear his internet history and how he's still smoking his old pipe and photos that he took of Mistress Potato Head and I mean it's all just too much information and definitely not gonna go over kids' heads at this point. Oh, no thank you. But then there's other parts that are genuinely intriguing, like how it opens up with a chase sequence of a criminal ham and potato head that also comes to be in some capacity in the real thing. And the exploration of broken toys and maybe this element of talking to humans, it's, it's, it went in interesting directions and I like some of these jokes. But overall, this was a cash grab of a film that touched on some good points, but comes off as problematic now and is nothing in the face of what we actually got. And thankfully, that's the timeline we're actually in. As the CEO of Disney, Michael Eisner, stepped down in early 2005 and Robert Iger took over. With his head screwed on right, he then had Disney purchase Pixar for $7.4 billion, and now that they were combined, they could focus on what was most important, creating innovative stories, characters, and films that delight millions of people around the world. And Circle 7 Animation was officially closed down in May 2006, with most employees brought into Walt Disney Animation Studios. A happy ending for all, and a sigh of relief that we're not truly in the absolute worst timeline. And though nothing really came to fruition, for a brief amount of time, they got their greasy fingers on Toy Story, Finding Nemo and Monsters Inc, and what truly scares me is the possibility that they would have had The Incredibles as something Disney held the rights for. Blech. Not for me, thanks. That would have been a childhood ruined. So Pixar lives on and Pixant was dissolved, but maybe next month we'll return to this dark old time to cover the other two scrapped reinterpretations. For now, I'd best leave it off here. Oh, it was pretty lengthy on this whole thing anyway. Mine has been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. So yeah, that was the first episode of the Cancelled series. Let me know what other kind of productions you've heard about that maybe would pique your interest. I'll do the research if you send me a suggestion, and we'll see what we can make do out of all that. You can either send it to me as a little tweet on Twitter, or put it in our video suggestions tab over on Discord. I do see them all, I've been writing them into my list, they'll make it through eventually. But yeah, there you go, that's the new cancelled series.